again, thank you, Norton Hall Band. There's a new level of cool in Norton Hall, I see. I like it. Uh, thank you, Randy, you know, Dr. Stinson, for uh, your uh, kind words of introduction. I usually do a better job of, of hiding my mountain roots than, than today, Randy. I, I was uh, leaving home in my work van and uh, realized I was on a flat. So I pulled over in the grass and I ran and jumped in my old pickup truck. And, and if you notice uh, a truck outside with dog boxes in the back and shell casings around it, and that's, that's me. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm never too comfortable standing here where so many giants of the faith have stood. So many of my heroes, even this past week, have stood. And especially given that I am acutely aware that standing here does not qualify one uh, as one of those heroes of the faith. But I am certainly grateful for privilege of, of standing here and of opening God's Word to share with you today. We're going to look at First Chronicles this morning, chapter 16. So be turning there with me in your Bibles, First Chronicles 16. I appreciate Randy making reference to my full title as Executive Director-Treasurer. And as the treasurer for 2,400 churches of the Kentucky Baptist Convention, I want to say to you that we are grateful to be able through the cooperative program uh, to provide scholarship for your education that reduces the cost of it somewhere between a third and, and a half. Uh, I hope you know that the churches of Kentucky are doing their part to the point of, of uh, sacrifice. In fact, thanks uh, to men who you know well like Herschel York and Adam Greenway and Bill Hennard, faculty members of, of uh, Southern Seminary, uh, the Kentucky Baptist Convention will forward more of our cooperative program dollars outside of the state convention and to the SBC uh, than any other state convention in the Southern Baptist Convention this coming year with the exception of the new startup convention in Texas. And Bethancourt will tell you it's hard to get ahead of Texas. But we are grateful for the leadership that has been given uh, here in Kentucky. And the reason that should matter to you is that if you are here training uh, to take the gospel to the nations, that will be your funding. It will pay your salary to the International Mission Board. If you are here training uh, to plant a church through the North American Mission Board, uh, that will provide startup funds that you will need someday. And today, of course, uh, you are here studying and learning, getting your education that's being provided for in part through the cooperative program. In return for that sacrificial generosity, we ask only that you pass along that sacrificial generosity. Uh, when you go to pastor or plant your church, lead that church to be a Great Commission church that gives through the cooperative program. When you make your way to the mission field or to the professorship, then be sure to join and give your tithe at a good strong CP giving church and you will have the opportunity to pass along that generosity. We thank God for what he's doing in this avenue. One of the reasons that I make mention to that as I come to 1 Chronicles 16 this morning is that I believe that kind of generosity helps us to accomplish what David, the king and psalmist, calls us to in this prophetic word, a psalm outside of the book of Psalms, 1 Chronicles 16. I want to begin by looking at four verses, verses 8 and 9 and verses 22 and 23, or 23 and 24, and as I do so, I want... I want to uh, call your attention to what is a, a fourfold command to evangelize the nations. Beginning in verse 8, David says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known from the Hebrew Yada, make known his deeds among the peoples. Verse 9, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell, from the Hebrew Siach, tell of all his wondrous works. 
Down to verse 23, sing to the Lord all the earth, tell from the Hebrew basar, tell of his salvation from day to day. Verse 24, declare safar, his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. David employs four different words to exhort God's people to proclaim God's salvation to the nations. Yada, siach, basar, safar. If evangelism is proclaiming the good news of God's salvation, as Dr. Booker taught me it was, then this psalm has much to teach us about evangelism. The context of the psalm, if we were to describe it this morning in literary terms, is the climactic resolution of a deadly conflict, a conflict involving the holiness of God. You remember that conflict. You remember the context. David has it in his heart to bring the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Testimony, to Jerusalem. The Ark had not been called upon, the Scriptures teach us, during the entire reign of King Saul, revealing the spiritual condition of a people who had a king but no longer recognized their need for the King of Kings. From the beginning, the Ark had symbolized the presence of God among his people, When the Lord gave Moses instructions regarding the building of the ark, he told Moses it was to be treated as holy for it would represent God to the people. In Exodus 25, the Lord even says that he will meet with Moses above the mercy seat, that covering of the ark between the two cherubim that adorn the ark. Responding to this neglect that had taken place during the reign of King Saul, David is unintentionally neglectful himself in his first attempt to recover the ark. You recall the ark is found in an outlying community in the house of Abinadab and loaded on a new ox-drawn cart. But as David leads a procession of 30,000 men celebrating, an ox stumbles The cart shifts, probably thinking it would fall to the ground and this holy and sacred article would be broken to pieces. Uzzah, a son of Abinadab, takes hold of the ark to steady it. And God strikes him dead. Suddenly in the midst of the parade, it's a corpse. King is so upset by what's taken place, immediately he calls off the venture. A resting place is found for the ark nearby, and the thousands go home. Three months pass, and the scriptures don't tell us uh, how David came to the awareness. Maybe someone uh, came and shared it with him. Maybe he's pouring over the scriptures himself, but, but at some point, David comes to an awareness of his neglect, of what went wrong, of why the judgment of God fell upon a man who seemed to be trying to save the ark. David comes to this awareness that when God had given instruction to build the ark, he had also given instruction as to how the ark was to be handled and carried rings with wooden poles so the priest could carry the ark and no one could touch it. And the warning had been given for one who would touch it would die. With this realization, David leads a second effort, this time transporting the ark according to God's instruction. The journey is a success, and that's where we pick up here in 1 Chronicles 16. David is leading the celebration, and he begins to recite this psalm that speaks of the need of those who know the Lord to make him known. It isn't in a vacuum that David repeatedly in this psalm calls on God's people to make God known among the nations. It is three months on the heels of a death of one who had offended the holiness of God. And it's now in the midst of this pilgrimage in which God's holiness has been respected that David calls upon those who know and love and serve the holy God 
to make the holy God known. With this renewed sense of awe over the holiness of God, David speaks, and what we learn from his words about God's holiness are lessons, I believe, that are essential to evangelism. In fact, we learn that God's holiness is essential to evangelism. How so? First, the message that we are to make known in evangelism, the message we are to tell, to, to declare, is that God is good. And God's goodness is merely a reflection, a reflection of, of His holiness. David tells us in verse 9 that we are to tell, to sack, to tell of God's wondrous works. Verses 24 and 25, David says, declare his marvelous works, for great is the Lord. You've tasted him. You've seen that he is good. Augustine called God the good of every good, the good of all goods. And indeed he is. Thank you, Randy, and other members of the faculty and staff and the seminary community who have been praying for the Chitwoods. My wife is recovering from her battle with breast cancer. We began our courtship 30 years ago. In the eighth grade, we celebrate our 20th wedding anniversary this summer. We've had a lot of fun growing up together and spending our lives together. But cancer hasn't been any fun. Surgery isn't fun. Chemotherapy isn't fun. Watching your hair fall out isn't fun. The nausea surely isn't fun. Numb feet, and tingling fingers, no fun. Mouth sores aren't any fun. But God is good. And he has been good to us. His kindness as a skilled and tender physician tending to my bride and his daughter has humbled me before him. He has been good. We can file no complaint against him. Rather, coming out of this valley, we declare anew and with voices raised, our God is great and he is loving. He is kind and he is good. The Holy One of Israel has shown himself in such a beautiful way to evangelize a broken, sin-sick, pain-ridden world. We point to a good and holy God and we say that he is enough. Cling to him. Holiness is essential for the message that we will bring the world. That he is good because his, his goodness is simply a reflection of that holiness. And another lesson that David teaches us about this uh, essential nature of holiness with regard to evangelism, the message that we declare in evangelism is that God will judge. And as with his goodness, God's judgment it's tied to his holiness. In fact, it's required by his holiness, is it not? David makes reference with the memory of God's judgment upon Uzzah still fresh in his mind. David declares in verse 14, He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. And near the end of the psalm in verse 33, he warns, Then shall the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes to judge the earth. The Bible makes clear the reality and the standard of God's judgment. Hebrews 9.27 Just as it appointed for man to once die, after that comes the judgment. 
1 John 5, 12, he who does not have the Son does not have life. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. The reality and the standard of God's judgment has been made clear. The day is coming when every person of every tongue, tribe, and nation will stand before a holy God to be judged. His holiness demands this judgment, and as sinners, none who are counting on their righteousness can withstand his judgment because we are unholy and cannot even stand in his presence. We're condemned already. So many don't even know it. There will be billions of people facing eternity separated from God in a devil's hell. Should not they be warned that a holy God will judge? Should not they be pointed to how that judgment has rested upon one who took our place? How is God's holiness essential to evangelism? We, we declare that God is good, his goodness being a reflection of his holiness. And we warn that God will judge, his judgment being required by his holiness. But third, and joyfully, the message we have to make known in evangelism is that God saves. And as with his goodness and his judgments, God's salvation flows from the river of his holiness. Verse 23, David says, sing to the Lord all the earth, tell of his salvation day after day. That covering for this holy box called the Ark of the Covenant that was so symbolic that David, David wanted the Ark to be in the city of Jerusalem, building a tabernacle for it, a place where the Lord's people would gather and worship and have this renewed sense of his presence in their midst. The covering for that Ark also had a name. The mercy seat. God's holiness and his desire for a holy people is forever clad with mercy. With God's mercy. Thus we have good news to share. It is appointed for man to die once and after that comes the judgment. So Christ, the author of Hebrews, goes on to say, having been offered once to bear the sins of many will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who eagerly wait for him. He who does not have the Son does not have life, but John begins by saying, he who has the Son has life. Indeed, as Paul tells us in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but he doesn't stop there. The gift of God is everlasting life through Christ Jesus our Lord. God has met his own demand for holiness. He has satisfied his own wrath through the death of his son. The one whom the author of Hebrews calls the high priest who is holy offered up himself as a sacrifice once for all. So we declare that God will save because God is holy. This connection, God's holiness and our understanding of it being essential for evangelism it takes us one more place in this text. The text reveals that one more way the holiness of God is essential, is essential to evangelism is that the message that we have been given to declare is that the chief end of man is to glorify God. And God receives glory because he alone is holy. He alone is worthy of the glory that comes when lost souls are saved and gather around his throne for eternity and sing his praises. Anything ever referred to in Scripture as holy whether it is the Ark of the Covenant, whether it is the Holy of Holies where the Ark was kept, whether it is the priests who serve the Lord, whether it is the Sabbath day that is to be kept holy, or the people of God who are called to be holy because God is holy, these things are only holy once they have been consecrated to the Holy God. Apart from that consecration to a Holy God, there is no holiness to be found in a box inside a tent. 
No holiness to be found on a day. No holiness to be found among the priesthood. No holiness to be found among the people. Only those who have been consecrated to God are declared in Scripture to be holy. Therefore, David says of the holy God, verse 24, declare his glory among the nations. Verse 28 and 29, ascribe to the Lord, O clans of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Is he owed glory? Is God the Holy One due glory? Indeed he is. Here's the part of evangelism that we must not miss. Evangelism increases the glory of our holy God. When we share the gospel and God saves a sinner, that sinner will be one of the saints gathered around his throne declaring, holy, holy, holy forevermore. A vision for increasing God's glory among the nations will change your life. My life was changed. Driving a church van on Saturday afternoons across the hills of Owen County, Kentucky. My first pastorate after graduating from the seminary. We began to try to reach out to the migrant workers in our community and on Saturday afternoons we'd pick them up and bring them back to church. And there the ladies would be cooking a good meal a home-cooked meal for men who were so far away from home. Uh, we would usually play a soccer game while we waited for the meal to be prepared, and, and the white guys always lost. <laughs> and then we'd make our way to the sanctuary where the gospel would be proclaimed in Spanish. And to see these men who in so many ways were so different than I was, the, uh, their appearance, their language, their culture, to see them respond the same way I did to the good news that there is a holy God who loves them, who stands to judge because His holiness demands judgment, but who saves. To see them with tears streaming down their face. And to welcome them as my brothers. That changed my life. My life was changed in the slums outside of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. One of our IMB missionaries in the afternoon, he, he asked if I would make a trip to, with him. And, and we made our way out to a little roadside encampment. There was a lady there who who had asked that a pastor come and pray a prayer of blessing over her home. I was the closest thing the missionary could find, and so he took me out. She met us in the doorway that wasn't a doorway. The doorway to a house that wasn't a house. Pieces of cardboard tied to sticks. The door, a piece of old plastic covering a hole in the cardboard. We went inside, stooping over, no lights. I heard a rustling and a whimpering. It took a few moments for my eyes to adjust to the light. And then I saw her two babies laying there in the dirt. My mind went back to my children and the safety and the luxury of our home here in Kentucky. And to look into the eyes of this young mother whose babies were laying in the dirt and to know that she just wanted someone to come and pray that the holy God would bless her home. Changed my life. Change began some years before that. I was about four years old, and there was a knock at our door one evening. Living in a rented house where my single father was raising 
three boys on his own. He went to the door and it was two deacons from the First Baptist Church inviting him to come to worship. I'm not sure what those deacons from the First Baptist Church thought we had to offer First Baptist Church. We didn't have much to offer First Baptist Church except trouble. (laughs) And we brought it. (laughs) Oh, but we found a church family there that that loved us, ministered to us. And then there was another knock. About four years later, our pastor just had graduated from Southern Seminary, stood in the doorway. My older brother had been asking questions about what it would mean to give his life to Christ, and, and Brother Alan came at my father's request to share with him. He sat in the green chair in the corner. My brother pulled up a kitchen chair in front of him, and my younger brother and I just sat on the carpet and listened in. And as he shared the gospel that night, uh, he got three for one. As we all put our trust in Christ, two weeks later we were baptized together at the First Baptist Church. How grateful I am for a church family and a young preacher boy from the seminary who had a concern that God be glorified in a rented house and a broken home. How grateful I am for a holy God who loved me satisfied his own wrath through the death of his own son and who will be glorified for eternity by the one he has saved. We have been called to take a message to the nations and to our neighbors. Why do we go? Because a holy God has called us to go. Might he be glorified as we go. 